Hey, folks, how are you? How you guys doing? Is that light bothering you guys in the back? How you doing, Revelation 22:13? Sorry, bro, you had to be part of that drama. God bless you. How are you guys? I'm a little later than normal. Just before I even begin, is that light bothering you guys, or is the light okay? Hayden, what's up? Hayden. Hayden. Why is that name familiar? Hayden. Oh, was that the Assyrian brother? If the light's okay, that's fine. Sorry, guys. I couldn't get on yesterday because stuff happened. Yeah. Thank you, Revelation 22, 13. It's, it's not so much even telling me how to teach. I'm not all-knowing, and I got issues, and I got sins. It's when someone masquerades and pretends to be spirit-filled while they're condemning you and slandering you, <clears throat> all the while accusing you of the same. And that's why I have to be, be very careful, people who think they're spirit-filled more than they are and that they're walking in union with the Spirit. But may God have mercy on us. The Lord Jesus wash us in his blood, and the Holy Spirit sanctify us and transform us and not discipline us, even though we deserve it, but be patient with us in Jesus' name. Been there, done that, Revelation 22, 13, got the T-shirt. I've, I've been around a lot of people who think they're spirit-filled, and they speak as if they're spirit-filled. And, and then they'll egg you on, cause you to stumble, and say, oh, Jesus bless you, brother, after causing you to sin. That is what the devil does, right? But anyway, God have mercy. The Lord Jesus have mercy. The Holy Spirit have mercy. Father have mercy. Lord Jesus have mercy. Holy Spirit have mercy. Folks, I'm going to have to do solo today. I don't have my team with me. Protestant believer is not here. He's working late. First and the last that wasn't able to show up. So I'm going to take questions on various topics, whatever question you may have as the Holy Spirit guides me and the Holy Spirit leads me to answer whatever question the Holy Spirit wants to be answered. So we would just want to say we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, and please forgive us for our shortcomings. Please forgive us for our imperfections. Please forgive us for succumbing to the flesh, our carnal desires, crucify our flesh, mortify our flesh, destroy our flesh, Father, and fill us with life from the Spirit, fruit from the Spirit, love, compassion, and passion from the Spirit, boldness from the Holy Spirit, patience from the Holy Spirit, grace and mercy from the Holy Spirit, and self-control, self-constraint, self-restraint by your Almighty Spirit filling us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you just sanctify us wholly and completely. Sanctify our bodies, our souls, our spirits, our minds, every part of us, and flood us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Flood our loved ones in the blood of Jesus Christ. Flood my daughters in the blood of Jesus Christ. Cleanse us, purify us, wash us in the holy blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. And Father, perfect my ability to interpret Scripture, to recall the passages correctly. Save me from stammering and confusion. And bless the people here. Fill them with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love and your peace and your joy with holiness and purity and cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. Again, the blood of the Lamb, the holy blood of the Lamb, Father. And Father, <clears throat> save me from stammering and confusion and bless them with the wisdom and knowledge and understanding so we can understand your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit live out your word. And please help us, perfect us to love each other and forgive us when we cause each other to stumble and sin against each other, Father. We love you, Father. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. And Father, please, Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health that I need, and perfect my sights physically to see and spiritually. Have your way, Father. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Save us from the evil one and bless the connection for your glory in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'll go, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, folks. Uh, yeah, my sight's going bad. Pray in Jesus' name if he wants me around to keep me healthy. I may need glasses. My sight is getting worse and worse. Right? Okay. I was asked two questions before I began the session. Uh, I don't know if the sister is here. Zena, if she's here, she's probably not. That's fine. Either I'll answer those questions first or I'll see what questions you have. This is your time to ask me questions. So ask me questions. The question was about Jesus, our Lord, turning water into wine you're sad brother i don't know what that means why am i sad brother 
Sam looks stunning today. Kind of fresh, new look. What up? I have no idea. One person says, I'm sad, brother. And then someone says, I look stunning. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know, Michael. Why? Am I sad because you're saying I look sad? Yeah. Oh, you're going to ask me about water turning into wine? Okay, I guess. I guess I'll answer that. And another question was about the prodigal son. I had answered that on Discord, but I thought I should answer that also for the live stream. And I pray the Lord Jesus brings in the regulars, even though it's a little later than usual. The prodigal son, what we can learn from the prodigal son and what we can learn from our Lord Jesus turning water into wine. Weston, it's live Q&A. So if you have questions, write them down. So here, let me ask you guys, do you want me to answer uh, the issue of the water being turned into wine first? Or do you want me to do the story of the prodigal son first? And I'm going to have to do both. Read Bible passages and <clears throat> explain them. So I won't be posting verses in the text. So bear with me. Water into wine? Okay. Water into wine. Prodigal son. Let's see. How many water wine? One, two. Prodigal son. Two and two. Three. Oh, three. Three for prodigal. Uh, it's a tie. Water into wine first. Three and three. Oh, Jose's the tiebreaker. Oh, no, we're tied again. Oh, it's prodigal son. Oh, now we're tied again. Come on, man. Okay, water and wine. All right, okay. Okay, let's do water and wine in Jesus' name. And I'll do prodigal son. I'll do prodigal son too. I'll do both, God willing. So let's take it. It shouldn't take me too long to unpack, but pray but by the power of the Holy Spirit that he loosens my tongue, saves me from stammering and confusion in Jesus' name. All right. Pray for that internet connection because I have no control. Okay. Water into wine. Now, even before, even before I get to that main text, I already wrote out the verses for your convenience. So when I say wrote out, meaning the verses that I want you to write down, because remember, we don't have Protestant believer, and we do not have first last to post verses for me. So write down John chapter 1, verse 19, John 1, verse 19, because I can't read the entire first chapter, but I want to show you a pattern. I want to show you what's happening. John chapter 1, verse 19, John chapter 1, verse 29, John 1, 29, John 1, 35, John chapter 1, verse 35. John chapter 1, verse 45. So 119, same chapter, verse 19, verse 29, verse 35, verse 43. Did I mention 43? I did mention 43, right? So chapter 119, chapter 129, chapter 135, chapter 1, verse 43. Put down those passages because you're going to see they're relevant. Nothing happens by chance. So let's begin at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Okay. Let's begin at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Thank you, Tippy. There, hey, sister, how are you? Tippy, Tippy, yay, Tippy, yo. We had a lot of drama for my mama. Hey, what's up, Cambelo? Sela. But, you know, it's, your name's not Sela. Why you say it's me, Sela? Your name is not Sela. We had a lot of drama for my mama in your room, Tippy Bear. But anyway, bear with me because I don't have anyone posting verses. So let's begin at the beginning of God, John 1, trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and bless the session for the glory of Jesus and truly transform us to be doers of the word. Please, Lord, please in Jesus' name. Okay, now, John 1, 1, we're going to start at John 1, 1, because you're going to see what's happening in John chapter 1 and chapter 2. But this is where I need your undivided attention. Listen carefully, because I'm trusting the Spirit to enable me to plumb the depth of this <clears throat> miracle and try to dig out all the gems and the diamonds and the gold you know the meat of this passage by the power of the holy spirit for the glory of jesus and god bless you guys thank you i enabled super chat two days ago and i didn't know it was going to go wild god bless you you know who you are the lord jesus bless you for contributing via super chat may he richly bless you and preserve you for the glory of the father's holy spirit the lord jesus preserve you for his glory even though Super Chat takes 30%, oh, well, better than nothing, right? Beggars can't be choosers, and we thank the Lord for anything he gives us, even a breadcrumb, because we don't even deserve that. Now, if you're now following me and you're paying attention, 
John 1, 1 begins with the words, in the beginning <clears throat> was the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Oh, Jonathan, Simon, thank you, brother. Can you post? Are you able to post, man? Hold on, bro. What's up with that, man? I just made you a mod, baby. I didn't know you can post. All right. You're now one of my moderators. That means you're now part of the, the click. That's okay. That's all we use is King James here. Right? Anyway, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now pay attention. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Right? He was in the beginning with God. They'll translate it variously. Then it says, all things were made through him, and nothing has been made without him that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That's John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Okay? Follow me. Listen attentively as the Lord Jesus blesses us to focus and understand. In the beginning, there was this divine person, this eternal person called the Word. This Word was an intimate communion and fellowship with someone else who is called God meaning God the Father in this particular context. And he's been with God the Father from the very beginning. And then it says, all things were made through him, through the word. The Father used the word to create the entire creation, to bring all creation into existence. All things were made through him. And nothing has been made without him that has been made. Pay attention. And then it says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. What John is doing, he's giving you an inspired exposition of Genesis chapter 1. We believe inspired because we believe the Holy Spirit inspired John. So the Holy Spirit fully incorporated John's unique personality in communicating the revelation of Christ through John. So the gospel of John is inspired by John. That's what we believe. Yep. The best way to give is PayPal if you want to give quickly because they don't take 30%. You know, so... PayPal is the way to go, and here's my email. Thank you, Daryl. There you go. Let me just give you. Okay, now, but follow with me. I need you guys to focus and pay attention. Okay? Focus and pay attention. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, is an inspired exposition of Genesis chapter 1, particularly verses 1 to 5. John is expounding, explaining Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and showing us where Jesus fits in Genesis 1. Everyone with me? He's showing us where Jesus fits in Genesis 1. Everyone with me there? Before I move on, he's trying to show you where we find Jesus in Genesis 1. Now, remember John is written in Koine Greek, the common Greek spoken by the common person in the first century. That means someone who's reading the Gospel of John in Greek, he would pay attention to the following words, en arche or arche. I'm not going to try to pronounce it like a Greek speaker would. En arche. En arche is precisely the way the Greek translation of Genesis 1-1 begins. When you read Genesis 1-1 in Greek, it begins with the words en arche. En arche. Okay, make sure you're getting this. I'm not confusing you. I'm not losing you. I know I'm a little later than usual in getting to the live stream, but better late than never. <clears throat> Let me go to Genesis 1. Let me show you that. Here's the English translation of Genesis 1. English translation of Genesis 1 from the Greek version. This is the English translation, the Greek version of Genesis 1, where we what we call the Septu Septuagint. The Septuagint, Septuaginta, translation of the 70. There's the link. Let me post it again. Folks, when you go there, though you may not be able to read the Greek, if you look to your right, here's what you're going to see. If you look to your right, here's what you're going to see. These two words. You, you, click on it, confirm, and 1611, this is for you too because you're an up-and-coming apologist and you want to teach the meat of scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray the Lord will use me in your life to be a blessing. You'll see those two words, right? Septuaginta, translation of the 70. You're going to see those two words. These are the Greek words 
right? The Greek translation of the Hebrew barashit, right? Barashit. Barashit is Hebrew of Genesis 1 1. When they translated barashit into Greek, they used the word N R K, N R K, N R K, N R K. These are the same two words used by the Gospel of John in John 1 1. Anna Groin, she just posted it. She posted Genesis 1 1 in Greek. N R K, Epoisen. Ha theos ton uranun k or kai ten game. That's the Greek rendering of Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Now, let me give you the Greek of John. I'm not trying to press you with the Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm a student of scholars. But sometimes I need to look into the original languages of the scriptures in order to show these connections and bring out the meat by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I hope you don't mind. I'm. God, sanctify my heart, purify my motives, never to do it for the praise of men, for fame or fortune. Do it sincerely for the glory of Christ to bless you, right? I don't like to be talking about the Greek because sometimes it gives the impression that someone, oh, see, if you know Greek, you're special. No, no. You're special when you're born of the Spirit. You're special when you belong to Jesus Christ. You're special when you're made one with Christ by the Spirit of the living God. Now, if you go, go here, here's the link. Here's the link to the Greek of John 1.1. 1, 1. He gave it to you. Now, if you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, if you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, sorry, man, I'm buffering. Pray. Yeah, I'm Fall. John 1.1, 1, 1, you're going to notice it's NRK. You're going to notice it's NRK. If you look at the Greek of John 1.1, 1, 1, you're going to notice it's the same two Greek words, NRK. What's up, Ron here? Yeah, I don't know. I'm buffering again. Exactly, Hayden Tang. See, this is the reaction I like. Oh, God, oh my gosh, I never realized John and Genesis begin the same way. Yeah, not necessarily faith love. No, no. When God said that's not necessarily the logos, you're trying too much and too hard to try to find the word of God in Genesis 1-3 where it says, and God said, right? Vayomer Elohim. No, that's not where you find Jesus. Just be patient, sister. Be patient or brother. I don't know if it's sister or brother. Right? Okay. Here's the link again. Pray that the buffering goes away in Jesus' name. There you're going to see that John 1.1 1, 1 begins with the two words, NRK, that we find in the Greek translation of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. So, guys, are you making the connection? John has deliberately begun the gospel with the opening words of Genesis 1-1, because he wants to show you Jesus' role in the creation account of Genesis 1-1. Right? Everyone see that? Everyone see that? Just want to be, before I move on to the next point. Everyone caught that, right? Okay. The second connection with Jesus in John 1 and Genesis if you read Genesis 1, 3 to 5, it talks about darkness and light and God separating the, the light from the darkness and he called the light day and he called darkness night. The second connection with John 1 is in Genesis 1, 3 to 5 where there you'll find the mention of darkness and light and God separating the darkness from the light, calling the light day and the darkness night. That's in Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5. Do you see that That in Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5? If you see that, that's where you get John 1, 5. John 1, 5, it says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it, overcome it. So in John 1, verses 4 to 5, we are told, In him, the Logos, the word Jesus in him was life. That life was the light of men. And verse five says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend or overcome it. You see the echo to Genesis one. Please, my God. What's this connection? Do you see the connection with Genesis one? So what you find in John one is an inspired exposition of the Genesis account of creation 
where John shows you where Jesus fits in Genesis 1. I don't know what's going on. Hold on. Sorry, the buffering is bad. I don't know, is it this time now or what? John 1 is an inspired exposition to show you where Jesus fits in the Genesis account of creation. Okay? The Genesis account of creation. Hopefully it stays. Let me know if the buffering is bad or not. I don't know. Maybe this is not the best time, but I'm trying. Okay, now, with that said, with that said, here you see that John 1 clearly is echoing the Genesis account of creation. That's inarguable. How many days did it take God to create the heavens and the earth? Six days. There was evening, morning, day one, day two, day three. And then he rested on the seventh day, right? Ron here. Ron here, I was asking you last time when you said that you have to have tough skin to deal with Sam. I hope you weren't attacking me, brother. Because if you do, I'm going to be hurt. I'm going to cry. Even though I may be tough, sometimes I just need love. Where is the love? Okay, so if you got that connection, seven days, six days, God created heavens and earth. Seventh day, he rested, right? Seventh day, right? Everyone with me there? Seventh day, God rested. And when he created male and female, in Jesus' name, bless the connection for your glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then he created male and female to become one flesh, holy matrimony, right? Male and female come together, become one flesh, husband and wife, one flesh. In fact, when did God finish the creation and entered his seven-day rest? When he created the female to become one with male, right? Did you get that? Want to make sure you get it. Seven days, right? John 1, echoing Genesis 1. John 1, an inspired commentary on Genesis 1, showing you where Jesus fits in the Genesis account of creation, showing you he was the God that was there with the Father and the Spirit who created all things and whose Life-giving power, life-giving energy, energized creation, gave life to creation, and union with the Father and the Spirit. Okay, but because now with that said, let's count the days. Are you ready now to count the days of John 1 and John 2, leading to the wedding at Cana in Galilee? Because everything has been deliberately placed there by the Spirit for a reason. There's nothing accidental or coincidental in the Bible. Everything deliberately designed by the Spirit to point to the glory of the triune God, to the glory of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Right? So are we ready to count the days? Pray for my sight physically, that it stays strong as well as spiritually. Okay. John 1.19. After the prologue, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. John 1.19. John 1.19. Watch here. Thank Jonathan Simon, who is now posting verses. God bless you, brother. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? So now John the Baptist. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, blood of Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's count the days. Okay, John 129. Yep, it's okay. That's what it is. The connection is bad. I think it's because it's now everyone's coming home. John 119. Now let's count the day. John 129. There's not much I can do. The next day, count. The next day. That's day two. The next day. Are you counting? The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. The next day. So that's one, two, right? John 135. John 135. John 135. Again, the next day. What day is that? That's day three. The next day. John 143. John 143. Count. I'm not that good at math. The day following. That's four days, isn't it? The four, fourth day. Four days, right? The day following. Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find the Philip and say to them to follow me. The day following, count, four days, guys. Now let's go to John 2.1. 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 John 2.
No, it's not day, day five, Lightning Samurai. I hope you're just playing, uh, having fun. And the third day, count, the third day, five, six, seven. The third day from the fourth, how many is that? The third day from the fourth, the seventh day, and there's a wedding celebration, an echo of the Genesis account of creation, where God created all things and he ended, ended with a wedding, male and female. Did it sink in? God ends creation with a wedding, male and female. Seventh day, there's a wedding. I want it to sink in. Anyone, anyone not seeing it? Amen. Holy indeed is the triune God. Okay, seven. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, what did Adam call his bride? Genesis 2, 23. Genesis 2, 23. Watch here. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Woman. John 2, verse 5. John 2, verse 5. John 2, verse 5. Let's make the connection as the Holy Spirit guides us. Pay attention here. What does Jesus call Mary? His mother said unto him, I'm sorry, John 2, verse 4. John 2, 5 is good. My, my apologies. That's in Hebrew, ish and isha. John 2, verse 4. John 2, 5 is where Mary, his blessed mother, says unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. But John 2, 4. Jesus saith unto her, woman. Hmm. Woman. What I have to do with thee, mine hour is not yet come. Genesis 2, 23. You shall be called woman. Isha from out of issue came. And in Genesis 3, she's called woman all throughout. The woman you gave me. Okay. Now let's read Genesis, John 2, verses 1 to 4 again. John 2, verses 1 to 4 again. I don't know, 1611, if it's sinking in with you. As well, Revelation 22, 13, if you're making these connections. John 2. Verses 1 of 4 again. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, right? And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. To the marriage, okay. Now watch here. 3 and 4. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. And then Jesus said, Woman. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now notice, like in Genesis 3, there was a woman who told the man what to do, to eat of the fruit of the tree. And in this account, you have another woman telling the last Adam what to do. But in this regard, this woman wasn't telling him to do something evil. So you have two women contrasted. The woman in Genesis 3, who tempted man to eat of the fruit of the tree, right? Thereby sinning and disobeying God. In John 2, you have another woman telling the last Adam, they have no wine. But what she tells him to do is not sinful because her request brought about the manifestation of the glory of God in the life of Jesus. Right? And what did the first woman do? She ate of the fruit of the tree, right? What is this woman asking him to do? To turn water into wine, right? And we know wine is the fruit of the vine. The fruit of the vine. The fruit of the vine. The fruit of a tree, the fruit of a vine. <whistles> Why do I say fruit of the vine? Let's go to Mark 14, 24 to 25. What did Jesus call the wine? What did Jesus call the wine? That points to his blood. Mark 14, 24 to 25. And I'm going to tie it in with John 2 in a minute. And he said unto him, 
This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for money. This cup is my blood. But now notice what he calls that wine that points to his blood. Verily I say to you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink in anew in the kingdom of God. The woman of Genesis tempted the man to eat a forbidden fruit from a tree. This woman of the new creation, right, <clears throat> tells the last Adam to provide the fruit of the vine, something good, not bad. Zena, yeah, this is all for you, John, too. Why don't you rewind from the beginning and try to work your way here because this is for you. I went really in depth. I'm, I'm answering what, why did Jesus make water into wine? I'm answering your question. So hear it from the beginning. Okay. Okay, everyone with me there? So far, you seeing that John is an inspired exposition on Genesis, right? On Genesis, are you seeing it? Okay. So you see this woman is telling him to turn this water. She knows he's going to do a miracle. I'm saying water because the text says he used water to turn into wine, to turn it into the fruit of the vine. And don't forget what the wine represents. The wine points to his blood. The wine points to his blood. With me so far? Wine points to the blood of the lamb shed to purify us of sin, right? To cleanse us, to purify us, right? Everyone got it or no? I just want to show because now I want you to see what's going to happen. Verses 5, let's read to 10, 5 to 10. And you're going to see what it's saying. 5 to 10. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Watch here. Get ready to get blown away. And there were set there six water pots of stone. Six water pots of stone used for what? After the manner of the purifying of the Jews. This was the water pot that the Jews would use to cleanse them for ritual purity, ritual cleansing. Pay attention why Jesus turned those water pots into wine. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw it now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants withdrew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, you bring out the, you don't bring out your best wine last, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. You know what that means? Jesus has brought us a better way, a better covenant, a better law, a better way than the old ways, than the ways of the Jews, and a better covenant to the old covenant. So God saved his best for last. The best isn't the Old Testament. The best isn't the Hebrew scriptures. The best isn't the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant. The best is the new covenant ratified in the blood of the lamb. So God saved the best for last, the better way. And here, those water pots, pay attention, the water pots that the Jews used to be richly pure. What you're being shown there is you are not purified by the rituals of Judaism. Your purification comes only by the blood of the lamb, the lamb which the wine points to. So it's not a coincidence the six water pots used for purification, ritual purification, ritual cleansing. Jesus turned those water pots into wine because he was pointing to a greater spiritual reality. You are not purified by the ways of the Jews. You are purified in my blood, which the wine points to. So what you're supposed to get from this miracle is God has now saved the best for last. And his best has now been revealed in Jesus because he, he brings a better way, a better co covenant, a better sacrifice, right, and a better law. Did it sink in or no? A better creation, a new creation. 
There's really no significance in six here, but you can say six is the number of man, where seven is the number of perfection, the number of God run to Christ. Six, the number of man, man's ways. Seven, the number of God, the number of perfection, which is why the wedding takes place on the seventh day. And why the seventh day? Because his provision for eternal rest. Sorry, I'm buffering again. Okay. Yeah, Adam Sheikh. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I'm buffering. Okay. So, okay, let me explain again. You can say that six represents the number of man. This is the way of man, man's ways. But the wedding takes place on the seventh day, and the wine, the water transformed into wine on the seventh day, because the seventh day is God's rest day. It's his provision of everlasting rest found in the Lamb whose blood is shed for our purification. Please, my God, please, my God. Yeah, I'm sure. <sighs> Sorry. It's me. Man, what is this? Okay. Hope it came through. All right. Everyone got it so far? Maybe I have to go closer. I'll probably have to go upstairs and go a little closer. Sorry about that. Let's see. Let's go up a little bit. Okay. So, sorry. I may have to go up to go to the router because I don't know. The connection is not too good today. Let's see what happens. You're going to have to take a ride with me. All right, this is the beauty of having bad internet connection. Okay, hopefully it's better now. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Because I'm hitting because I'm trying to imagine your face and I'm smashing it. <laughs> okay, pray for the glory of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully now I'm closer to the router. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So you see the what the water, this miracle that Jesus performed, pointed to a greater spiritual truth. Thank you, brothers. Sheep work. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, all you super chatters. All right? Okay. Is that clear now? You see that John chapter 1 and 2, if you tie it in together, is pointing to the Genesis account of creation and its recreation in Jesus Christ. Because John is a story of Christ recreating the creation that he made at the beginning that has fallen, which he will now restore and purify all believers by his blood, which the wine pointed to. Right? Right? That's so far you got it right. Six water pots, the number of man, right? Man's ways, which cannot purify. That's why the wedding takes place on the seventh day, because the seventh day is God's rest. It's his provision of everlasting rest through faith in Jesus, the Lamb whose blood is shed, which the wine points to. Is it making sense now? Are you getting it? Right? Try my best. Let's see. I don't know the connection. I hope it stays up because I want to answer these questions. Not like I said, pray for my place. I get it sooner than later. And so I can get top notch internet connection. Now, if you still doubt that this is meant to point to Jesus' death and resurrection and his shed blood, I don't know if you paid attention to John 2 1. The wedding feast takes place on the seventh day. But it was also the third day, John 2, verse 1. So let's see how many of you paid attention. John 2, verse 1. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Third day, huh? Hmm. The seventh day, which is the third day, the third day is when the Lamb rose victorious. Hmm. 
You caught it now? If you start at John 1, verse 19, and you read all the way to John 2, verse 1, this was the seventh day which the wedding banquet took place, which was the third day, right? Seventh day, third day. Hmm, no, I, I, it's all coincidental. It's all coincidental. You see it? Is it sinking in, making sense? Before I move on to the next point. I just want to make sure you're getting it. I don't know. Coinky dink. Uh, yeah, coinky dink. Okay. So now notice the contrast. The woman of Genesis tempted the first Adam to eat of the fruit of the tree and sin. The woman of the new creation, right? The recreation of the heaven and earth, the mother of our Lord, asked him to provide wa wine, the fruit of the vine, which he did. And in so doing, Mary, this woman, became instrumental in bringing about God's timetable sooner than later and manifesting the glory of the last Adam. So what she did was good. What Eve did was bad. You got it? We'll start at the beginning. Go listen from the beginning. Everyone got it? Did it make sense now, the water into wine? And why he said, usually people bring out the good wine first, but you saved it for last because that is a miracle pointing to the fact that the old ways of the Jews, incomplete. The ways of Judaism is not the best. The old ways of the Jews cannot cleanse you. The old ways of the Jews, incomplete. The Mosaic Covenant is inferior. The Old Covenant is inferior. The Old Testament is inferior to that which is better, brought, brought about by the Lamb, because God saved the best for last. If that made sense, we can move into the story of the prodigal son. Clear? But it makes sense now. Behind every physical miracle, there is a spiritual truth, a spiritual point. Spiritual truth, a spiritual point that the Holy Spirit intends for the people of God to see. Revelation 22, 13, it made sense, right? Despite the distractions, the nuisances of the buffering. May the Lord Jesus bless this for his glory. Because if that you got now what it means, I can move on to the prodigal son. All right? We can move on to the prodigal son. If it's clear. All right. No questions on this now? Because I'm closer to the router now. No questions on this? Okay, what about the prodigal son? Someone asked me to break it down. The story of the prodigal son is found in Luke 15. Okay, now, we're not going to read it, but you get the story. Let me tell you how it reflects the heart of God. Yep, this book is amazingly corrupt, Anna Growing. It's so corrupt that it shows you its supernatural origin, its divine origin, and supernatural consistency okay now the prodigal son the story of the prodigal son let me just again sum up the prodigal son. It's in luke 15 you have two sons an older son who's committed to his father and he's faithful to his father you have a younger son who is lazy who is carnal <clears throat> lustful gluttonous right a hedonist he tells his father, give me my share of the inheritance. And then he leaves and he squanders it on a hedonistic lifestyle. Hedonism is a life of pleasure, of, of feasting, of partying, of drinking, of revel revelry, of orgies, right? Until he finally went broke, hit rock bottom, found out he had no true friends. They're only his friends as long as he had money. And then hit the lowest of the low, hit rock bottom, 
because out of desperation to survive, he started working in a pigsty. Now, I'm going to help you understand how deep the saying is because you have to put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jew, understand what Jesus is saying in light of its historical cultural background. The worst thing that a Jew could do is work in a pigsty, work cleaning pigs, dirty animals, swine, which Jews were forbidden from eating. Are you with me there? He hit rock bottom. He hit the lowest point imaginable for a Jew. Working in a pigsty, cleaning dirty animals, animals forbidden in the law of Moses, showing that he was even dirtier than this pig. Are you with me there? It's on Luke 15. We're not, we're not going to need to quote it because I want to understand what he did. Number one, by asking for the inheritance before his father died, the son was greatly insulting his father. Basically, what he was saying to his father is, you are as good as dead to me because the inheritance is only given upon the death of the parent. You only allot an inheritance when the father dies. Here the father is alive and the son wants his inheritance before his father dies, <clears throat> sending a message to his dad, you're as good as dead to me. I don't care about you. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. I just want my money, what you can give me. Give me my portion. Let me move on with my life because as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. Now, according to the law of Moses, this was a wicked, rebellious son who had to be put to death. Exodus 21, verse 15, and Exodus 21, verse 17. Let me bring out the meat by the power of the Holy Spirit to show you the level of insult, degradation, and humiliation the son put his father through. And then the level of love and compassion shown by the father. Exodus 21, 15, and 17. And then he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Now notice 17. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now Deuteronomy 21, 18 and 21. Deuteronomy 21, 18 and 21. Watch the meat of this passage and watch the heart of the Godhead. The infinite, loving, compassionate heart of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit revealed in this story. Watch. Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which he will, he will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard, exactly like the prodigal son. He took his father's share, his inheritance father, and a drunkard because he squandered it, you know, living lavishly, hedonistically, a hedonistic lifestyle, eating and and feasting and getting drunk and orgies. He did the very thing this rebellious son does, deserving of death. Now notice Deuteronomy 21, 21. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So notice what the son did. Asked his father for his share of the inheritance, which meant to his father... You're, you're as good as dead to me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I just want what you can give me. Give me my portion and the hell with you. That's basically what he told his dad. I don't want you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I just want what you can give me. Give me what's owed to me so I can move on and the hell with you. That's basically what he said. I don't want you, I want your money. I don't want you, I want your provision. I don't want you, I want your blessing, what you can give me. I can do without you. 
You understand the point? I can do without you. You're as good as dead to me. An insult of the highest degree. He had insulted his father. So now what happens? He hits rock bottom. He hits rock bottom. He's working in a pigsty. He comes to his senses and he says, man, you know what? I'm not good enough to be my father's son because I've sinned against heaven and him, against God and my, my father. I deserve death. So I'm just going to beg my father to allow me to work as a servant because even his servants, right, fare better. Even his servants live lavishly. I'm not good enough to be considered his son anymore. Hopefully, he'll just accept me as a hired servant. Now, here's what's beautiful. As he approaches, the servants see the son is approaching. Word gets back to the father. Now, because the son had insulted the father, degraded the father, made the father lose face and respect in the eyes of the community, the father, for him to maintain integrity, would pretty much have to shut the door on his son, disown his son, right, and remain in the house. But guess what he did? The father allowed himself to be dishonored in the eyes of the community, in the eyes of his servants, in the eyes of others, because he ran. He didn't simply allow the son to enter, and then he greeted the son and forgave him. He ran to the son and met him halfway, and then fell on top of Hugging him, crying over him, hugs and, and kisses. In other words, what the father had done was a social taboo. Because the son had dishonored the father, the father, to maintain respect, would have to exercise constraint, constrain his emotions, right? And let the son come, bowing before him like a dog. You know what the father said? The hell with what people may think. The hell with social taboos. The hell with social norms. I don't care what people think because I love my son. And my son has finally returned to me. And he ran. And in so doing, he humbled himself, humiliated himself in order to show his son how much he was loved. You understand that? You understand what he did? Hit the like button. Yes. You understand the point of the parable? Not only did the son dishonor the father and deserve death, the father, instead of exercising self-constraint, controlling his emotions, in order to maintain respect in the community, he said, the hell with what people think, the hell of, of social taboos, the hell with, you know, <clears throat> with social issues. I don't care what society says I should do and shouldn't do. I don't care about social taboos. What I care is for my son. My son was dead and he's alive and he's come to me. And he ran and fell on him. Do you understand now the depth of the prodigal son, the story? You don't like it? Get lost. Who told you it's swearing? Maybe in your world it's swearing. You don't like it? The hell out of here. How about that? Do you like that, fidget spinner? You want me there? You understand now the depth of the story? The depth of the story? It's not only showing you the depth of the, the, the depravity of the man. It's not only showing you the depth of the depravity of the son, how wicked and disrespectful he was to his father. By taking his inheritance, he's pretty much saying to his dad, the hell with you. You're dead to me. I just want what you can give me. I want the provisions, not you. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. As far as, as, far as you go, I don't want nothing to do with you. The height of disrespect, making him worthy of death. Not only does the father not order him to die, not only does the father shut the door to him and not allow him to enter the house, the father doesn't even do that. The father humbles himself, humiliates himself in the eyes of all by running to that son, falling on top of him with tears and hugs and kisses to affirm him. 
You see the depth that the father went in spite of the dishonor that he faced at the hands of his son? He was basically telling the people, I don't care what society says I should do or how I should behave or how I should react. I don't care if what you think I did was humiliating, that I humiliated myself for someone that dishonored me and deserved death. I don't care about that. I care about my son. I love my son more than social taboos, more than society's do's and don'ts. What society says, a, a respectful man, a man that's respectable, a man of honor should or shouldn't do. I don't care about any of that. What matters to me is my son has come home. Is that clear? Because I'm going to tie it in with the point of the chapter. And I'll get back to the brother in a minute. Folks, in that parable... The father who runs and falls on top of the prodigal son. That father in the parable represents who? That father in the parable represents who? Represents you? Okay, Michael Bethlehem. When you say God, which person of God? Sion, you got it. It's Jesus. Hafsa, you got it. UJ, you got it. Jesus. Jesus. How do I know Jesus? Because if you read the start of the chapter, Jesus is justifying and explaining why he associates with prostitutes and tax collectors to the Pharisees and the religious elite who represent the older brother in the parable. Let's go to Luke 15, verses 1 to 3. It represents Jesus. Luke 15, verses 1 to 3. Jesus gives three parables. Here. Then drew near unto him the, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus. Right? And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, did you catch it? Jesus shares three parables, gives three parables. The woman who finds the lost coin, the shepherd who searches for the lost sheep, and the father and the prodigal son to explain and justify why he, Jesus, welcomes sinners and prostitutes and eats with them and loves on them, even though the religious elite looked down upon such people. Jesus is saying, because I came for such people. So in the parable, the older brother represents the religious elite who look down upon prostitutes, tax collectors, the marginalized, thinking that they were too good for them and they were not worthy to be in the presence of the Pharisees and the scribes. And Jesus says, you do not know God and you do not know the heart of God. God runs with open arms to embrace this people. And like the prodigal, did you pay attention to Luke 15, verse 1? Did you pay attention to verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1? Because tax collectors were Jews working for the government, Rome, that oppressed the Jews. So that was considered an act of betrayal. How could you, a Jew, work for the Romans who have oppressed us to collect taxes from your people? You with me there? Notice Luke 15, verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? As he drew near to the home, he was near his father's home. The father came running. These tax collectors and prostitutes drew near to Jesus, and Jesus came running and fell on them with tears and hugs and kisses to say, Welcome. You are loved. I love you. I want you to return home. I want you to dwell with me. I want you to live in my presence because I love you. I don't condemn you. Though you've dishonored me, though you've disowned me, though you turned your back on me and you love the world more than me, my arms are always open to embrace you if you draw near.
right? Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father's being. He who sees him sees the Father. So this is a parable about Jesus and the Father and the Spirit, about the three persons of the Godhead, the depth of their love, how deep their love is for the lost. So the father in the prodigal is Jesus, but he's also the father and the spirit because Jesus is the perfect visible image of what the father is like. So if Jesus loves prostitutes, the father loves prostitutes. If Jesus loves tax collectors, the whomever Jesus loves, the father loves. You catch it? So in the parable, the older brother represents the religious elite. The older brother who said, I've been with you. I didn't squander your money. I didn't disown you. I've toiled. And you threw a feast, a party for this son of yours. In the parable, did you notice? The older brother didn't say, my brother. This son of yours. He wouldn't even dignify him to call him my brother. Do you know that? Read the parable. This son of yours squanders your money, disowns you, comes and you kill the fatted calf and put on a rich robe on him and hold a feast for him. You never did that for me. This son of yours. He didn't even say my brother. He didn't even say my brother. Hold on. Let me, let me charge my computer. Catch it? He didn't even say, my brother. In other words, he was not good enough to be my brother. I'm too good for him to be his brother. He's beneath me. He looked at him with contempt. Just like the religious elites, the Jews were looking down on the tax collectors and the prostitutes, looking at them with contempt. They're too dirty to be in our presence. Right? You with me there? So do you now more appreciate the story of the prodigal son? Khan el do you want me to block you and send you on your merry way? Let me know. And maybe you return, and then we'll fall on your neck with tears, hugs, punches, and kicks. Right. Yeah. So everyone with me there? The guy thinks he's being spiritual. This is what I hate when people think they're being spiritual. Oh, uh, brother, can you then forgive too? One thing the parable does show you, because let me tie it in because he's trying to tie it in with my ex-wife. Okay, he's trying to tie in with my ex-wife. Let me now go a little deeper into, into the parable. Did you notice there was a condition for the prodigal son to meet? He had to come to his senses repentant and return to his father's house. Did you catch the condition? You understand? Because he's trying to tie in with me. Are you willing to forgive your ex-wife, Sam? Well, hold on. Notice the condition in the parable. The man hit rock bottom. By hitting rock bottom, he came to his senses, got convicted. He realized he sinned against heaven. And as far, even says in the par prodigal, I have sinned against heaven, against God and my father. And he knew he was unworthy to even be called his father's son. When he showed brokenness, true, sincere brokenness, true, sincere repentance, the father ran and fell on him, and he says, it's okay, son. Which teaches us another lesson. Some sinners have to hit rock bottom, have to hit the floor face first, rock bottom, before they come to their sentence, senses and acknowledge their sin and return to God. Do you know that? So this guy who thinks he's spiritual and holier than thou, Tham, what about you, Tham? Would you answer the question? 
What if you're, would you forgive your, how do you forgive someone that justifies their sin, justifies adultery, justifies hate, justifies anger, justifies violence, justifies destroying a home, justifies using a legal system to try to destroy a servant with no sign of repentance whatsoever. Is that what the, the parable is teaching you? No. In fact, did you notice another thing? The tax collectors and the prostitutes drew near to Jesus. Exactly run to Christ. Amen. Did you remember Luke 15, 1? They drew near to Jesus. The prodigal son went back home to his father. Drew near to his father. No, Guy Wilkerson. If he committed that kind of heinous sin, he needs to be disfellowshipped. If he repents, then he needs counseling and he needs to be handed over to civil authorities for committing incest. But are you with me there? So let's really unpack the prodigal son. Notice the prodigal son hit rock bottom. He hit the lowest of low, working in a pigsty. The worst thing that a Jew could do before he came to his senses. He hit rock bottom. You know what Jesus is saying? Sometimes some of us, God forbid, May the Lord Jesus forgive us and wash us in his blood and seal us by his spirit and transform us without having to hit rock bottom to love him and obey him and fear him. Please, Lord Jesus, please save us from our flesh. But some of us have to hit rock bottom face first, bam, hit the ground face first, rock bottom, become broken, have nothing, become nothing before we come to our senses and realize I need to go back home to my father. Right? Wasn't that story of the, uh, the story of the prodigal son? When he was living lavishly, when he had money and he was partying and feasting and getting drunk and, you know, gor gorging himself like a gluttonous pig and orgies. The last thing he had in mind was his dad and his brother and his mother and God. But when he lost his money and everyone abandoned him, realizing he had no true friends and out of desperation, he had to work in a pigsty. Then he came to his senses. Man, I'm even worse than these pigs. These pigs are eating better than me. What have I done to myself? What have I become? How did I get here? You get my point? That's why if you read Luke 15 again, it also says he came to his senses. Who do you think convicted him, pierced his heart, to make him come to his senses. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Now, how does that apply to us? Let me now give you some practical application because Jesus' parables have meaning for us today. They had meaning for the people hearing it at that time, but it has meaning for us today. Many of us are like the prodigal son. We say to God, I want your blessings. I want your provisions. I want money. I want comfort. I want a nice home. I want a good spouse, healthy kids, but I don't want you. Give me my share. Give me my provisions. Give me material blessings. Give me health. Give me a good spouse. Give me a good family. Give me a good career, but you stay out of my life because you I don't want. Don't give me you. I don't want you. I want your provisions. And you know what God does sometimes? You know what he does? To show us it's not the provisions that satisfy you, but it's the giver and he alone can satisfy you. 
Okay, here you go. You want money? Here you go. You want homes? Here you go. You want spouses? Here you go. You want children? Here you go. And look, you're still empty and nothing. And you know what's the greatest proof of that? Look at the Hollywood stars. Look at the athletes. Look at the people whom people idolize. Look at the Kardashians. Look at Bruce Jenner. Look at uh, Jennifer Lopez. Look at Holly Berry. Look at Robin Williams. Look at Epstein. Look at them all. Look at Brad Pitt. Jennifer, you name it. Where are they? How well are they? Right? And I can go on and on. Look at Bill Cosby. Right? Michael Jackson. You name it. And so this is what God is showing us through them. He's saying, you who have eyes to see and ears to hear. These are all prodigal sons and daughters. I've given them their share. They have health. They have wealth. They have beauty. They have fame. They're idolized. They have children. And they are even more empty, more miserable, more so than ever before. See, reality around us, in Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. Reality all around us, life that we live, proves day in and day out how accurate the Bible is. Our experiences, the experiences of human beings, people around us are proving day in and day, not, day out, day in and day out as the Spirit loosens my tongue, the Bible is absolutely 100% correct about the human condition. Unbelievers are proving how accurate and true the Bible is. Right? Right? How do you explain Robin Williams, the world at his feet, a millionaire, loved by all, idolized by all, commits suicide? How do you explain Brad Pitt, one of the most handsome human beings God created, married to a very beautiful woman, millionaire, became an alcoholic and lost everything? And I can go on and on. Do you know why? Anthony Bourdain, exactly. You know why? Because God is showing us it's not the provision. It's not the inheritance. It's not the material blessings, financial blessings, the physical blessings that can satisfy you. I, the giver, it is the giver and the giver alone. I, God, the giver, I alone can satisfy you. All of this doesn't matter. Relationships won't give you lasting happiness. Don't believe me? Explain to me, for the love of the triumph God, whom we love, Father, Son, and Spirit. Why do we have about 60% divorce rate if marriage was a solution to the problem? Okay. So what do you learn from the prodigal son? Like Hater Wood, you went and squandered the talents I gave you. Like Hater Wood, you hit rock bottom and you live in the pigsty. But unlike Hater Wood, you came out of it, he's still in the mud with the swine. <laughs> if you guys don't know, Hater Wood's here. See, the problem with Hater Wood, he loves the pigsty, right? He loves just <clears throat> wallowing in the mud with the other pig. The you know swine, but anyway, but coming back to the issue, pay attention to the issue as the Lord Jesus blesses this session for his glory. And we focus. Here's the point the prodigal son realized it wasn't the provision, it's not my share of the inheritance that 
brings true and lasting happiness. It's my relationship to my father. Because understand in the story, when he lost his wealth, he lost everyone who pretended to be his friend. He was left alone and abandoned. But one person did not abandon him, his father. You see the point of the parable? And how does that tie in with Jesus? Jesus is basically telling us, the money you have, the friends you have, the position and status you have, even your spouse and children, there is no guarantee they'll still stay faithful or you'll still stay faithful to them. There is no guarantee that you're going to still have this position and status or continue to make the money you make. You can lose it all, but one thing is guaranteed. One thing you will never lose is my love for you, my commitment to you, my faithfulness to you, because I love you more than you can imagine. Right? So that's what the story of the prodigal son is. So I hope I answered those, those two questions. Zena asked me about water and wine. I explained that. I also explained the prodigal son. I was asked this in Discord, but I said I'm going to do it in my live stream because I want this to be recorded and used by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus as long as the Spirit anoints these words for the glory of Jesus. And I hope you were blessed. I hope it made you fall more in love with the triune God, more in love with Jesus, and stand more in awe of the depth and beauty of his word, the Holy Bible. Right? Is that clear? Everyone got that? Because I'll open up. I'll open up the session for other questions as the Spirit leads me to answer. Okay. Any other questions? This is your time to ask me questions. Whenever the Spirit puts in my heart to answer, I'll answer. Thank Jonathan Simon. He, he came in at the last minute to post verses for me. And why should I, the scammer is Muslim? Why should I? Amen, Anna. He's asking me, why don't I draw the sign of the cross? Okay, why should I? Just explain. I just want you to give me your answer why I should. And I do the sign of the cross, but why should I? I just want to know. Why are you asking me to do it? Yeah, I will. Okay, I'm going to do the Sabbath day. Thank you. Okay, I'll answer that one. I'll answer the question on the Sabbath. Should we observe the Sabbath? Okay. Where do we find that unless I do the sign of the cross, I won't be blessing people? That if I simply pray to the Father and the Son and the Spirit and end the name of Jesus Christ, that's not a sufficient blessing. Jesus' name. So unless I do the sign of the cross, I'm not going to be blessing someone. If I ask the Father and the Son and the Spirit to bless in the name of Jesus, I have to do the sign of the cross. You see what you just did? You imposed a tradition on me. It's a, not a bad tradition. It's a good tradition. And uh, for the record, I do the sign of the cross all day, all night, because I was raised in a community that did the sign of the cross, the Assyrian church. Though for, for the most part, I went to Baptist churches. But when you tell me, why don't I, why should I? Right? Now, let me answer. Do you guys want me to answer the question on the Sabbath? Do we need to keep the Sabbath? And by the way, I didn't say you shouldn't do the sign of the cross. There is ancient tradition that goes way back. In fact, there's one source called the Odes of Solomon, which is a Christian source that talks about doing the sign of the cross. And there are people who actually date it to the latter part of the first century AD. So this is an ancient tradition going way back into the very beginning stages of the Christian faith where Christians would do the sign of the cross as a sign to the world that they belong to Christ. They were crucified with Christ and the world was crucified to them. So I don't have a problem with that. But when you tell me why don't I, why should I? There's a freedom to do it 
freedom not to do it. Because it's not commanded to do it, but it's not prohibited to do it. You get my point? Daily gripe. He is Jehovah who appears in dreams and visions to his servants. And that's the point of Acts 9. That's why Saul knew enough that the light that he saw that knocked him down and the voice that he heard, this was clearly the light in which Jehovah is clothed with, the light that Jehovah clothes himself with, and the voice from heaven would be the voice of God. So he knew this is Jehovah God, but he's confused. Why is Jehovah God saying I'm perse persecuting him when I'm doing what I thought he wanted me to do? Okay, so do you guys want me to answer the question about do we keep the Sabbath? Let me see. Medic asked me the question. Sabbath? Okay. This question is going to be quite nuanced because I have to unpack it and not simply give you a pat answer. The question is, every born-again Christian, born of the Spirit of God, must keep the Sabbath. Now, the question is, what Sabbath do we keep? Because there's more than one Sabbath. Did you know that? You have the Sabbath year, you have the Sabbath day of Israel, and you have God's Sabbath day. You have God's Sabbath day, the Sabbaths of Israel, which was a weekly Sabbath, and the Sabbath year. Which or what Sabbath do Christians born of the Spirit keep? Pamela. You know you're killing me by asking me that question. You know they're in Jerusalem, right? They're in Jerusalem, so they go back to Galilee, right? So what do you want the text to say? Go back to China? He's in Jerusalem, and they're going back to Galilee. You want me there? So, which Sabbath do Christians born of the Spirit keep? Are you guys not ready for the answer or no? Are you ready for the answer? Pamela Wilton. Bethlehem is not Galilee. Galilee is not Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in Judea, and they're at the temple presenting Jesus. Why shouldn't it say they're going back to Galilee when Joseph and Jesus are from Nazareth in Galilee, you're joking, right? Pamela Wilton, you're joking, right? I know you're pulling my leg now. I know. Let's laugh. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> okay. Let's get ready now for the answer to this question. Okay. Are you ready for the answer to this question? No, Pamela, don't email me. I'm not going to answer your email. Let me try this again. Jesus' parents are from Nazareth in Galilee. They only went to Bethlehem for the census. When Jesus was born, they took him to the temple and present him there. Then when all the formalities was done, they're not going to stay in Bethlehem because they're not from Bethlehem. They're from Galilee. So they go back to Galilee because that's where his parents are. They're going back to their hometown. Pamela, did you get it now? There is no debate on this. There is no mystery answer. It's plain as day. If you read from Luke 1, 26, and you read all the way to Matthew 2, verse 39. I'm sorry, Luke 2, 39. Luke 1, 26, Luke 2, 39. Mary is a native of Galilee. Joseph is a native of Galilee. How do they end up in Bethlehem? Because of a, of a census where they had to register according to their ancestral home. And Joseph is from the line of David, and David's ancestral home is Bethlehem. They go there. Jesus is born there. They present him in, in the temple in Jerusalem, and they go back to their hometown. It's not rocket science. Hey, can you send this dog on his merry way to smooch the black stone like the filthy pagan he is? 
and save lives. I never said God said, save lives. Don't put words in my mouth. I never said God says marriage is a solution to problems. I said people think if they get married, that will solve their problems. So represent me correctly, save lives, or you won't be able to save your life because you won't stay on this chat. Okay. Folks, can you show me anywhere where I said God said that marriage is a solution to the problems? Or I was talking about people looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Okay, now let's get into the Sabbath. Are we ready? Sorry but for all these distractions. And in Jesus' name, may the connection stay strong, Lord, for your glory. Okay, sorry. Now it's acting up too. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's answer the question that I was asked because I'm being asked questions that only take me less than a minute to answer, like Pamela's question. Of course they went back to Galilee because Mary and Joseph, the they, are going back to their hometown, taking Jesus, Mary's firstborn son, which he conceived and gave birth to as a virgin, to their hometown. Doesn't take rocket science. Okay, now, let's talk about the Sabbath. Pay attention. Don't be distracted. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us focus for the glory of Christ. I don't mind answering additional questions, but let me now finish answering this question. There's not just one Sabbath. There's God's Sabbath. There's Israel's Sabbaths. And even Israel's Sabbaths, there's a weekly Sabbath and the Sabbath year. Right? Israel had a weekly Sabbath and a Sabbath year. And then you had God's Sabbath. The question is, are Christians expected to keep the Sabbath? Yes. Which Sabbath are Christians expected to keep? Depending on which Christian you are referring to. Are you referring to ethnic Jewish Christians? Are you referring to Gentile Christians who are not ethnically Jews? Who are you referring to? Are you referring to ethnic Jews who believe in Jesus? Or Gentiles who are not ethnic Jews who believe in Jesus? Which group? Don't ask the question now, save lives. So you can save your life and not get banned. Let me finish the answer to this question. Yes, Sir Added Spork. Your ethnicity will determine how I answer the question because of the book of Acts. As far as Gentiles are concerned, pay attention because I'm about to prove it in a minute. You don't like the answer? I'm sorry. I'm going to be as honest as I can to the scriptures. If I'm wrong, may the spirit correct me to never repeat a mistake and save you from that error. But if I'm right, may confirm it in our hearts for the glory of Christ. Okay, now listen. Ethnic Gentiles send save lives out of here because save doesn't want to save his life or her life. Please, guys, send these new citizens that don't respect the rules, right? Ethnic Gentiles keep God's Sabbath. Ethnic Gentiles keep God's Sabbath. What do I mean by God's Sabbath? Go to Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Let's answer that question. I already answered in previous sessions. Medic for Christ, you should look for it, but I'll answer it again. Okay. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So God's seventh day began when creation was finished, and that seventh day is ongoing. It hasn't ended. Notice this is the only day that doesn't say there was evening, there was morning, day seven. All the other days, it says there was evening, there was morning, day one. There was evening, there was morning, day two, because each day had a beginning and an end. But the seventh day had a beginning, and it hasn't ended. Because God hasn't stopped resting. Every day is God's Sabbath day. Every day is God's rest day. Every day, 
that transpires is the day in which God is resting, in which God has entered his Sabbath. So today is God's Sabbath. When tomorrow co comes, it will be God's Sabbath until the end of the age when Christ returns. OJ, which part, right, of Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3 wasn't clear? Did God rest from creating the heavens and the earth? Yes. But resting from creating the heavens and the earth doesn't mean he's inactive in sustaining it and preserving it. Because God entered his rest day to now manage it, supervise it, superintend it, and preserve it. Clear? Everyone getting it so far? Israel's Sabbath weeks, weekly Sabbaths and Sabbath year were modeled, were modeled after God's Sabbath. Israel's weekly Sabbath, where six days they worked, seventh day rested, and then repeated their work cycle. And their Sabbath year, six days they would till the ground. Seventh year, six years they till the ground. Seventh year, the Spirit gives me unction to speak clearly. Seventh year, they would let the ground rest from being toiled, from being tilled, right? Those were modeled after God's Sabbath day. How do I know? Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Exactly, serrated spork. You're right. God's Sabbath day, rest day, remains until the end of the age where Christ will then usher in a new heaven and new earth. You got it, Serratus Spork. But now read with me, Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Zena, just read with me. Don't ask me a question that's going to have me go off topic and talk about the Catholic Church. Only an Assyrian is going to ask me that question when I haven't finished the answer. Like you've been here long enough. Allahu Akbar. Choose Jesus. Are you sure she's not proof of predestination? Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now notice why. For in six days Jehovah made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you see that Israel's weekly Sabbaths and Sabbath year are modeled after God's six days of creating the heavens and the earth and entering into his Sabbath day? I am answering that fearless Christian. Of course, I just said God's Sabbath day started and hasn't ended. So every day until the end of the age is God's Sabbath day. So today is a Sabbath day. Everyone getting it? Before I move on to the next point. Okay, Basharat Masih. What has that got to do with God being in his Sabbath day? Can you explain that to me, Basharat Masih? God bless you, Dwana. Listen to the rest of it tomorrow. If everyone got it, let me give you another text. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Thank Jonathan for helping me to help you. Michael, Michaela, you're going to be patient for me to answer, or are you challenging me? You're going to be patient? All right, you're joking, right? When you're asking me, where does it say it did not end? Really? So in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, where it says he entered the Sabbath, but there's no reference to there was evening, morning, day 7. Like you have in the six previous days, there was evening and morning, day 1, so that means day 1 ended. There was evening and morning, day 2, so day 2 ended. You're joking, right, sister? Okay. Now, if you wait, I'm going to show you that it hasn't ended. But, Michaela, just be patient. 
Why are you guys so animated and not being patient for the answer? Does the Sabbath day really upset you that much that you start, you know, reacting? Where? Where is it? What's wrong with you guys, man? Do you want the answer? Are you guys now manifesting? You're getting angry. Ah, wait, no. <laughs> What's wrong? Bob Tree, why would you misquote Jesus? Abolishing doesn't mean that Jesus simply upholds the law. He perfects the law, completes the law, and fulfills the law and the prophets and brings out their true spiritual meaning and application. And don't ask me any questions while I'm answering one question. Stop doing that, folks. Let me answer the question. When I'm done, ask your question. Okay, let's go back and read Exodus 31, 12. I mean, have you noticed how animated some of these folks have been getting? Have you noticed it? How animated? I haven't even finished the answer. Where does it say that? He's working. My father and I working. Hey, ooh, he, oh, ooh. Man, dude, calm down. Breathe. Here, here, breathe. Breathe. Don't meditate like Hindus do. Because that just breathe. Mellow. Mellow. Okay, let's read now. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Oh, no, God forbid, no yoga session. It's a Jilu session. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths. Here we go, buffering again. Sorry, we're buffering. Okay. Let's go again. Sorry, we're buffering by the grace of Jesus. I pray this session will be fruitful. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Notice Sabbaths, plural, Sabbaths, right? That ye may know that I am Jehovah that doth sanctify you. Okay, let's read. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, right? For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now pay attention. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jehovah. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Jehovah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So do you see now the second passage that says, Israel's Sabbaths, their weekly Sabbaths and their Sabbath year, modeled after God's Sabbath? Do you guys see that? Do you guys see that before I move on to the next point? I want to show you getting it. Or are we going to start reacting now? Hey, wait, wait, but it doesn't work until the day. <laughs> <laughs> I got mental issues, man. I got mental issues. Just pray if God is pleased to give me perfect health, perfect sight physically. I feel my age and I'm losing my sight. Yeah, I haven't even finished the answer, honestly. I haven't finished the answer. And everyone starts reacting. Yeah, where does it say it ended? <laughs> yeah, but Jesus said, I had father working to the day. <laughs> yeah, see, see, Igor. Okay, now, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Yeah. Watch here. We're almost done. <laughs> I like that laugh. I, I want to go, ah, ha, ha, ha. All right, read Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no man, therefore, judge you in me. Pay attention. And Zina, I want you to pay attention too. Michaela, you got to admit, you got to love my reactions. Let no man, therefore, judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. Did you guys catch it? 
In Jesus' name. Yeah, the Father, Son, and Spirit bless this. I'm almost done and everything. Man, when everything can go wrong, it go wrong. The buffering. Okay. Did you catch it? The Sabbath days are a shadow. And Christ is the reality. Did you see that in Colossians 2, 16 to 17? Everything in the Old Testament. Their holy days, the meats, the Sabbaths, they're not the reality. They are shadows pointing to a reality. The imagery is this. When you see a shadow, you know someone is about to turn the corner. Someone's about to show up. And the shadow will give you an indic indication what to expect. So if you see a shadow of a cat, a cat shows up. If you see a shadow of a dog, a dog shows up. If you see a shadow of a big, bald, semi-muscular man, then you know I show up, the Assyrian beast. You get it? So what Colossians is telling you, the Sabbath is a shadow indicating to us someone is about to show up. This shadow is not the reality. The shadow is telling you someone is about to show up. Get ready for his appearance. Get ready when he shows up. Recognize him. Who is that someone? Jesus Christ. So if you understand what you just read, the Sabbath is meant to point to Jesus. The holy days are meant to point to Jesus. The dietary restrictions are meant to point to Jesus. All of it points to Jesus. All of it points to Jesus. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus. The priesthood, sacrifices, the priest, Moses, the temple, the tabernacle, the holy day. Everything points to Jesus. You get it now? So I'm preparing you for the answer. I'm getting you to think biblically to see the answer. So do you now realize the Sabbath is to point to Jesus? So now you have to see... How does it point to Jesus? Okay, now let me break down God's Sabbath. God's Sabbath represents God resting from his work of creating the heavens and the earth. Now he simply maintains creation, preserves creation, sustains creation, and is redeeming creation, right? But the Sabbath points to resting from work, right? Resting from work. Now let's read Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 11. Let's break it down in two sections. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 6, and then 7 to 11. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 6, we'll pause, and then 7 to 11. Let's break it down into two sections. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 6. Thank you, Mark. You got it. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us, of entering into his rest, entering into God's rest, entering into God's Sabbath, not Israel's Sabbath. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. It did not profit the Israelites in the Old Testament when they heard the gospel because they didn't believe in the gospel. So it didn't benefit them. Okay, pay attention. Guys, you have to pay attention. Okay? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So the Jews before us heard the gospel. It didn't benefit them. They didn't believe. Let us not be like them. We heard the gospel. Let's believe in it. Or we're going to suffer the same fate. Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Wow. Notice four and five. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in his place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Now verse six. Saying, therefore, it remaineth that some must there must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Did you understand what you just read? The inspired author of Hebrews, which tradition says was Paul, he may have used a secretary, maybe Luke, says, guys, you know what the Old Testament says. In Psalm 95, 7 to 11, God said that the Israelites, because of their unbelief, will not enter my rest. So he destroyed them in the desert. But we know God has rested 
from the beginning, and he quotes Genesis 2, where it says, and God rested on the seventh day. So did you catch it? God's rest day, the seventh day, is the day we need to enter into by faith. And so when Israel did not believe God in the desert, instead of entering into God's rest, he destroyed them for their unbelief. Exactly, medic for Christ. God's rest day points to us entering into rest and not working for our salvation by our faith in Christ. So when you trust in Christ, your Sabbath begins. You enter God's Sabbath day. So today when you believe, you've entered Sabbath and you remain in Sabbath until Christ comes. That's Hebrews 4, 1 to 6. But now re let's read 7 to 11. Hebrews 4, verses 7 to 11. Thank you, Jonathan Simon. Hebrews 4, verses 7 to 11. Thank you, Susan Baker. You got it, Susan. The day you enter your rest by faith, every day is the Sabbath. Why do you think in Romans 14, Paul says, one person considers one day secret, but another person, they're all sacred. Because now we know the true Sabbath, it's God's Sabbath. And God's Sabbath is every day till the end of the age. And I entered the Sabbath when I trusted Christ. So today is Sabbath for me. Tomorrow is Sabbath for me. Monday is Sabbath for me. All days are the Sabbath for me. Hebrews 4, 7 to 11. Hebrews 4, 7, 11. Again, he limiteth a certain day saying in David, today, this is the author of Hebrews, today after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest in the wilderness, which he didn't, he destroyed them, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? If they had already entered rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day. They already entered that day. But they didn't, so he destroyed them. So now let's read 9 to 11. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered, pay attention to 10. Oh my goodness. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fa fall after the same example of unbelief. Did it sink in now? So tonight, go back and reread Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 11. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 11. The Sabbath that we, born again, spirit-filled believers observe, we Gentiles, is God's Sabbath. God's Sabbath began after creation, and it's ongoing till the end of the age. That's why the author says, Today, if you hear of his voice, today, if you hear and believe, today you entered Sabbath. Why today? Because today is God's Sabbath. Tomorrow will be God's Sabbath. The day after will be God's Sabbath. It is God's Sabbath every day till the end of the age. Then will be ushered a new heaven and a new earth. Did you get it? So do Gentile Christians obey the Sabbath? Absolutely. But we don't follow Israel's Sabbaths. Because remember, Israel's Sabbaths are a shadow. Who is the reality? Jesus Christ. So when we trust in Christ, by faith in Christ, we enter the true Sabbath of God, which began after creation. Make sense now? Yes, Jonathan Simon. Gentile Christians are loosed from Israel's Sabbaths. Let me repeat. If you're a Gentile Christian, born of the Spirit, and you're a true Israelite because you're a spiritual Israelite, you do observe Sabbath, God's Sabbath, which is every day. That's why Paul in Romans 14 could say, Hey, one man considers one day more sacred, 
Another man considers all days the same. To each his own. You are free. Right? So you have seven-day Adventists and so-called Hebrew roots guys that tell you, you got to keep the Sabbath of Israel. And I'm saying, you want me to keep the shadow of things? And ignore the reality, because what did Colossians 2, 16, 17 say? The Sabbaths are not the reality. They are a shadow. Christ is reality. I'm observing the true Sabbath. I'm observing Sabbath every day. I'm observing God's Sabbath. I've entered God's Sabbath. I'm resting in God's Sabbath by faith in Jesus Christ. You got it now? So Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. You want me there? Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Here is my Sabbath. I will give you rest. Here is my Sabbath. Come unto me, rest in me, trust in me, enter in me, in union with me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Be my yoke bearer and le learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Did you catch it? Come to me. I am your Sabbath rest. The Sabbaths were pointing to me. Christian, I am the true Sabbath. I am the true Israelite. I am the true circumcision. I am the true bread. I am the true law. I am the true priesthood. I am the true sacrifice. Everything that the law was is nothing in comparison to me. They are the shadow. I am the reality. You catch it? Do you catch it here? 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 2. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 2. Okay. And Lord willing, tomorrow we'll talk about ethnic Jews. Ethnic Jews. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Receive it from your heart. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succeeded thee. Behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that goes with Hebrews 4. Today, this day, if you hear his voice, right? Do not harden your hearts. Now is the day of salvation. Today, hear, receive, believe, and enter. You receive the marvelous, beautiful, supernatural, miraculous consistency of the Bible and how everything is pointing to Jesus. Everything is pointing to Jesus. The Sabbaths, the sacrifices, the priesthood, Moses, the Mosaic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, the law, the temple, everything, it points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. They are, Zeno. They are. Why did she stop her earphone? Okay. I will, Roger. Ro Rogan. I may do it tomorrow. I've done it in previous sessions. I may do it tomorrow again, God willing. So There's going to be another Q&A. So I may continue responding more fully by showing the responsibility of ethnic Jews. You get it? Is that clear? Did it make sense? So, do Christians keep the Sabbath? Absolutely. Which, what Sabbath do Gentiles, born of the Spirit, made spiritual Israelites, spiritual Jews, united to the true seed of Abraham Christ? What Sabbath do we Gentiles observe? God's Sabbath. Israel's Sabbaths are not the real deal. Remember what God said? 
You are to keep Sabbaths because I kept the Sabbath. So your Sabbaths are modeled after my Sabbath. My Sabbath is when you enter by grace through faith in Jesus and then join me in resting from working and trusting in the work of Christ, believing in Jesus and what he did, which is sufficient. Yep, Jonathan Simon is giving you a link. Nope, not replacement theology. See, this is the danger when you use emotive language to poison the wall. It's biblical theology. It's not replacing Israel. Israel, the nation, has a role to play in end-time prophecy. But they are not the true Israel because if you reject Jesus, God rejects you. It's expansionist theology, inclusivist theology. Right? Now, I've got to answer this question. I'm not here to attack Roman Catholics, Orthodox, or even Protestants, even those who believe that you keep the weekly Sabbath. Zena asked me, was it right for the church, because this is in the 4th century, you called it the Roman Catholic Church, the church to change the Sabbath day to Sunday and make Sunday the official Sabbath day? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Right? You cannot impose a day as the Sabbath day if it goes above and beyond what is written and contradicts it. You know, folks, there's not a single passage. Let me repeat this. Get ready for the challenge. Are you ready for the challenge? Are you ready? Here's my challenge for every one of you. Study intently, but listen to my challenge. Don't come and answer my challenge in error. So don't say, ah, but this verse, understand what my challenge is. Here's my challenge. Go through the 27 books of the New Testament. Find a single verse where the apostle said, the Sabbath has been replaced by Sunday. And go through the entire books of the New Testament and show where the apostles commanded, you must worship on Sunday. Okay, let me repeat again. My challenge. Let me, here's my challenge. Don't misrepresent my challenge and don't answer something I didn't ask. Here's my challenge. Read the ent entire 27 books of the New Testament. Find a single verse where the apostle said, hey, Sabbath, replace Sunday is the Sabbath. Right? And then find a single verse in the entire 27 books of the New Testament where the apostle said, we command you and we bind you to worship on Sunday. You must worship on Sunday. Did you hear my challenges? Did you hear my challenges? Did you hear my challenge? Don't come tomorrow and say, ah, but they met on the first day of the week. Ah, there was a collection made the first day of the week. That's not answering my challenge. That's misunderstanding my challenge. I'm going to repeat my twofold challenge, or if you want to say two challenges instead of two and one. See, again, you see what Stronghold did? You just did what I told you not to do, Stronghold. So your hold is very weak. Don't quote to me a passage where they're meeting when the Sabbath ends and Sunday begins. Because Acts 27, they're meeting at evening time, because the Sabbath has ended and Sunday began. And so they're gathering Saturday night to learn from the apostles. You see what he just did? Stronghold, let me repeat it again before I block you because you're not listening. Show me in Acts 20, verse 7, where it's a command, you must worship on Sunday, when Acts 20, verse 7 is simply stating that when the Sabbath ended, they gathered at evening, and at evening, that would have been Sunday for the Jews, that just because of convenience sake, because they gathered when the Sabbath ended. So what do you want them to do? Gather on Monday? The Sabbath ends Saturday evening, and it just so incidentally means that Sunday began when Sabbath ended. You believe this guy? He's not listening. So don't be stupid and make this mistake and answer in this manner. You get my point? Don't quote me a verse where they're gathering on Sunday. 
Let me repeat my challenge again. Let me repeat my challenge again. Quote a verse where it says, Sabbath has been replaced on Sunday because even Acts 20, Paul was observing Sabbath and when Sabbath ended, then he met in a house and started teaching Christian doctrine because now the Sabbath ended and they were free to travel and meet and gather. Let me repeat my challenge again. Quote a passage where it says, Sabbath has been replaced by Sunday and where they say, you must worship on Sunday. Yeah, now, did everyone understand what my two-fold challenge is? My two-fold challenge? Or if you want to say two challenges are? Did everyone get it? So don't make the mistake of stronghold by misapplying Acts 20, verse 7. And don't dare quote to me 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Those are not commands. Okay. Lord willing, you got till tomorrow. To try to answer. Okay. Lord willing, you have till tomorrow to answer when I do my other live QA part six, God willing. So I hope you were blessed. I hope you're refreshed. I hope you were challenged. I hope you laughed. I hope you got angry. I hope you got convicted. If I made any mistakes, may the Holy Spirit correct those mistakes in me, not to repeat them and save you from the, those errors. But if I said anything that was true, that was spiritual, that was faithful to scripture, that came from the Spirit, may the Spirit confirm all those truths in our hearts and give us the power to understand them, to live them, to love them, and proclaim them for the glory of the triune God. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Pray for me, for my health, for the provision to do ministry, for my daughters, that God will set me free and take me to a higher level and take us to a higher level to know him more intimately, to love him more passionately, and live for him more perfectly. And proclaim his glory to the nations until Christ comes or takes us home. And pray that my daughters are safe and I will see them again sooner than later. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus and perfect my sight physically and spiritually. Lord willing, part six tomorrow. No, it's okay. You can stay, brother. That's a gift to you. Hope you're blessed. Hope you're challenged. Hope you're edified as well as convicted, angered, and anger that's good to move you to dig deeper into the word. The Lord save us from our flesh, from sin, from Satan, and cause us to love each other more passionately, love him completely. We love you, Lord Jesus.